I, I think this goes hand in hand with what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us this morning. This is going to be a little bit of an expansion of that. This is, this is a huge topic, a huge doctrine. I want to talk about a, a, a word in particularly that's, that is particular that's found in the scripture. And let me, let me give you a, a, a couple of things to think about here before I tell you what that word is. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, uh, Paul, this, this apostle who walked in amazing power, um, power very much like the kind of power that Peter walked in. Uh, you remember the story of Peter in the book of Acts where he would walk the streets of Jerusalem and the, the, the best word that we have to describe it, uh, the Bible, the, the, the word used is so weak and so weak it's inappropriate. It says Peter's shadow would fall on people. Well, I mean, a, a shadow can't really fall on you. There's, there's no power to a shadow. Really, that's, that, that's an attempt to, to paint the picture of there was this glow, this aura, this force that emanated from Peter. Peter carried something in his earthly frame that when he walked by someone, they didn't actually have sidewalks like we have sidewalks, but if they did, when he walked by someone on the sidewalk, just this thing that surrounded him would fall upon the person that had been laid there hoping that Peter would walk by from his house to the bread store or This presence that was in him, radiating out of him, this aura is a better word than shadow, would simply hit that person and they would be healed, every one. To the extent that the Bible says the testimony of what was at work in Peter That the community, if anyone was sick, they'd simply lay them on the sidewalk, knowing that if Peter walked by there that day, that which emanated from him would heal the one who's sick. It wasn't, it wasn't like you hear these testimonies. Well, I, I, I hate these testimonies, quite frankly. Well, I laid hands on 100 people, you know, and 20 of them died before anyone got healed. I'm sorry that doesn't give me any hope. <laughs> I'm sorry, it doesn't. It doesn't build my faith one ounce. That's more glorifying of you and your persistence than it is of what's at work in us. Maybe it took you 100 times to get it figured out how to walk in cooperation with what is at work within us. Okay, that's a testimony of progress. But knowing that people died because you hadn't figured it out yet doesn't help me. I don't think that's the testimony of the work of the Holy Spirit. That's a testimony of our shortcomings instead. If what is in us is what the Bible says it is, and it is, the Word's not lying to us, God's not lying to us, that same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead that filled Peter, that was at work with all of its grace in the life of Paul, who, were bit, who was bit by deathly, deadly, venomous snakes and shake them off like nothing happened. If that is at work in you, and it is, we have a lot more to hope for than we'd ever thought. And when the Bible says these signs shall follow 
them that believe in my name, cast out devils, speak in new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. If that is true, we have lived and are living and may take a while for us to get into the groove, but signs and wonders are supposed to follow me. I'm not called to chase after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are to be chasing and following after me. And just go ahead and point your finger right to your own chest and say me. Because I'm not talking about me and not you. I'm talking about us, but not necessarily us together. Each of us individually, this is God's purpose and plan for us. This is his promise to us. And it hinges on, I believe, understanding this word in the scripture. So 1 Corinthians 2, 4, my preaching was not in persuasive words of wisdom, Paul said, although the man could preach. The basis, the consistency, the essence of his preaching was not the persuasive words of wisdom that he used, although he did use persuasive words of wisdom, but the essence of it was held in demonstrations of the Holy Spirit and power. Why? So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom coming out of my mouth, says Paul. He says, I want your faith resting on what I'm saying but on the power of God. This is why Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world, A, B, C, D, E, and gave them their instructions, but don't leave town until you are filled with power from on high. Thus he spake of the Holy Spirit. And of course, they had that experience. Why? Because not only did Paul not want those he was writing to to have faith in the words coming out of his mouth, but on what the Spirit, God Himself, was doing powerfully, he wanted them, he wanted their faith to have its confidence in the power of God to be at work. And it's the same with Jesus. His instruction to his disciples, us. Peter didn't have to say anything to the people he walked by. He didn't have to couch it in the right words, create a context. He was so in agreement without all of these distractions and obstacles within his own life that the power of God, that nuclear generator, if you would, was so unhindered that he would simply walk by people laying on the ground, crippled, healed. I remember a story of, uh, just so you kind of, Pull this out of ancient times, bring a little more modern. There's stories of uh, a wonderful brother, father in the faith, Smith Wigglesworth, over in England. He would, there are stories of when he would walk into, a, walk into the trolley or the train car. And people who were in the car would fall to their knees in the aisles of the car. And shout at him and say, my God, man, your presence convicts me of my sin. That kind of thing. He wouldn't go in preaching. He wouldn't go in on a soapbox. Just that which was at work within him, the Holy Spirit, was so unhindered residing in an earthen vessel just like you and me, that when he'd show up, he didn't show up with a lid on the bushel basket, hiding that light. Nothing to keep it hidden. 
it would just emanate from him. And people would have to respond to it. I want my words to be powerful. I want my presence to be powerful. I want my actions to be powerful. Not as I would hope or intend, but as God would hope and intend for me. And that's the place of humility. It's not thinking any more highly of yourself than you ought, or any, certainly, any less. False humility is still arrogance. Still pride on our part. Just the other side of the pride coin. One is I think myself to be this, and the other is I think myself to be this. The problem is I'm thinking of self. Not the power of God that's at work within me. I want to be yielded to that, amen? Yeah. I know you do too. So here's a discipleship golden nugget. We are to study to show ourselves approved. If we will do that, we do not need to be ashamed. If we do not study to show ourselves approved of God, we will be workmen who are ashamed and should be ashamed. So there is a place for repentance that in my preaching this morning that if you have not taken seriously the study of God's word, and let me, let me put it to you this way, if there is not something about the scripture that you are presently studying, then you're not a student. Because a student is simply one who studies. And we are not called to memorize the word. We're not, the Bible was not called so I can read it. The Bible was written so that I might study it. It's not the reading of it that makes me approved. Of course, you can't study it without reading. But reading's not the end of it. We're not just trying to plow through the Bible in a year. Amen. We're called to study it. Is it a good habit to familiarize yourself with it and read it? Yes. But that is not specifically what the Scripture calls us to do. It calls us that in our reading to actually be studying as well. Now, here, here, here's, here, here's another one for you that I'm sure you understand. The Bible was not written simply to be read, but studied. There's no book of grace. There's no chapter of healing. There's not the, the division, the testament of holiness or love or salvation or righteousness or hell or heaven or even angels. We can't go to the one book and find everything we would want to know and study about something. So rather, the way the scripture is written, it's like a tapestry where all of these different themes, subjects, and topics are woven into the whole, but we must dissect it. So studying is really the art of rightly dividing or dissecting the word of truth which means I'm going to need to familiarize myself with the whole. That's where reading would benefit you, where your mind would recall, oh, yes, righteousness. I remember there's a scripture over here. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. But because I've read it, now I can begin to study it. Oh, yeah. But unless my righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, I'm hopeless. So righteousness is a real deal. There are degrees of righteousness. It's not just simply a decree. I can be mostly right, or I can be very much righteous. So as I begin to remember all of the word that I've hidden in my heart because I've been faithful to read it, now the Holy Spirit can put his finger on a subject and say, time to study this. Time to study this. And Peter calls that a truth that is presently among us. In other words, something that in this day or season of my life, the Holy Spirit's putting his finger on, and he's, he's, he's wanting to amplify that. He's wanting me to not just know about it, he's wanting me to understand it. 
He's not just wanting me to believe in it. Yeah, I guess I believe in that. He's wanting me to walk in it. He's wanting me to practice it. He's wanting me to flow in it. He might not want me to be a novice in it. He want, might want me to be an expert in that subject. Man, we're talking a lot about healing. We're talking a lot about the power of God. We've got a major conference that we are investing a lot of time and money and effort into because we know this is something the Lord's speaking to us. I don't know about you, but I don't want to go through a conference or a season like this and come out of it unhealed. What a failure would that be where God says, I'm emphasizing this, I'm wanting to do this, but you've got to come into a full partnership with me and understand it where I don't just want to touch you again and have you sick the same way in another month. I want you not just healed, but I want you whole, healthy, fully walking in my shalom, says the Lord. That, that word shalom that's so weakly translated just as peace. It means a peace in your, in your mind, your heart, your emotions, your life. It's whole, nothing missing, nothing extra. It's, it's just exactly the way the Lord designed it. That's God's shalom. And he did not design us to carry dis-ease or infirmities. He designed us to walk in health and to maintain that health, to be healthy. He calls us into a partnership, yes. But also he calls us into an understanding and a belief that not only would my life be whole and healed and at peace, but that I would be an instrument of his to lay hands on others and freely give what I've freely received. That I would be his hands and feet extended into this earth. That's powerful stuff. And it has to do with us understanding this word. This word is, the, is a word that appears in the Bible... Five, in the New Testament, 528 times. The word Jesus appears like 900 times. But this word appears 528 times in the Bible. And I must tell you that most Christians have little or no understanding of what the word means. By comparison, agape love appears 99 times. That's a pretty important word. Faith appears 236 times. But I'm talking about a word that appears more than twice as many times as the word faith. Five times more than the word love. Grace appears 122 times. Hell, people spend a lot of time preaching about hell, teaching about hell. There's a hell, it's real. But it only appears the unlucky number of 13 times. Unlucky hell. But this word I'm talking about appears 528 times, and it is the word Christ. The reason most Christians misunderstand the word is because they think that's Jesus' last name. Jesus is his first name, Christ is his last name. That's not true. Christ is a, a descriptive word that describes Jesus when attached to Jesus. But that word Christ exists by itself in, mo in most of the times it's used in the New Testament. And what Christ is, is it is, it is the embodiment of, of everything that makes God, God. All of his goodness, all of his glory, all of his power, that's the Christ. And Jesus is the Christ, capital T, capital Christ. But he's not... I want to demonstrate to you that Christ speaks more of 
the anointing of the Spirit than it does of the man, Jesus. Jesus' name is Jesus. And after the resurrection and the ascension, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, Peter says this. He says, This Jesus whom you crucified... God has made both Lord and Christ. Jesus gained the appointment. Everything that he had left in heaven, when the Bible talks about this great emptying of, of the word, the word, the preexistent Pre-incarnate Jesus was known as the Word. John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He came into this world, tabernacled. That tabernacle means he took on a physical house and dwelt among us. So the Word who we know as Jesus, he emptied himself of everything that made him God. He was God, but he didn't function in this life, earthly life, as God. He functioned as the second Adam. Otherwise, it would have been cheating. And he could not have, have been the, the legal sacrifice for our sins and our redemption if he was anything more or anything less than what Adam and Eve were. And Adam and Eve, they had the divine nature about them because they were made in the image and the likeness of God, but they were not God, capital G. Jesus emptied himself, Philippians tells us. It's the word kenosis. It means a complete and utter emptying of one. Everything that made him divine. And he functioned as a human being and that's how we know, in spite of some religious folklore, Jesus, when he was a boy, he didn't make little mud doves and throw them in the air and they'd come to life with miracles. That's why it didn't happen. The first, the first miracle that Jesus performed by the power of God, by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that indwelt him, came upon him at his baptism and had manifestation at the wedding in Cana where he turned water into wine. Jesus, until he was filled with this Holy Spirit, he functioned only as a man, no miracles. There, there, there was no God at work in him, so to speak. He is the God man, always was, always has been, always will be. But he emptied himself of that and then after his baptism and infilling with the Holy Spirit, he functioned then as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. That's why he's our example, because that's the most that we could ever hope to be. We're humans, like Adam, Eve. But we're also like Jesus in that we can be filled with the Holy Spirit that Christ force, that anointing. See, Christ, by definition, means as the person, as the figure, the one who is anointed by the Spirit. A prophet couldn't be a, a king, couldn't be a king unless he was Christed by a prophet through the pouring on of oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That king, to be a legitimate king, had to be Christed, anointed, have oil poured over him by a prophetic representative of heaven. Or he could not exercise what they called their divine right. Couldn't do it. So that Christing, or the one who Christs, the one who anoints, the one who empowers, the one who pours grace upon is 
the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit that fills Jesus. Now, Acts 2.32, Peter, as a prophet, as an apostle, is speaking the truth. This Jesus that they crucified, not the Lord Jesus Christ whom they crucified, but this man Jesus who you crucified, God has exalted and made both Lord and Christ. This was added to him. That word Lord, if you were to study that word, what it means when it was used in the Old Testament, every time that word Lord is translated, it's a derivative of the word Yahweh. Later, in Greek and Latin, Yahovah. They added some vowels back into it and tried to make it pronounceable. But the Jews always called it the name. The name. They wouldn't even try to pronounce it for fear that they would get it wrong and offend God. So that word Lord, we use in our vernacular as God. The Lord Jesus Christ means the Father, his, his title, his position is Father. His name's Yahweh. And he put his name upon Jesus and says, everything that you walked away from in heaven and emptied yourself of, it's all back on you now. And the Spirit, all of that grace, all that empowerment, all of that which we know filled Peter, that glory was back upon him as well. So he's no longer just Jesus, the man. Although he is still a man, a physical being, because he took on flesh. He still is flesh and bone. He testified of himself. He said, I'm not just a ghost, right? Remember when he suddenly appeared in the room with the disciples? I'm flesh and bone, he says. He is, he, he is fully the God-man, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he was Jesus, John the Revelator at the Last Supper, right, when he was a, still a kid, oh, well, he just cozied up to Jesus. Jesus was like his daddy, his, his big brother. He laid his head on his chest. Jesus, you know, the guy that carries around lambs and says nice things and, you know, pets little children on the head and says, oh, bring them to me, I'll bless them, right? But John, the old man, 90-some years old on the Isle of Patmos, when Jesus appeared to him, it wasn't Jesus meek and mild. It was, the scripture says, the Lord Jesus Christ in all of his resurrected power, authority, godliness. And John doesn't describe him as, you know, the nice guy that just kind of sat on the stone and invited the little kids. He's still, invitation, still invitational to us and children. But it wasn't this non-glowing Jesus. But this Jesus who appeared to him is the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who had been given the fullness of everything that he laid aside in heaven to come be our Savior has now been imbued back upon him. And John says, I didn't snuggle up, up next to him and lay my head on his chest and say, oh, it's good to see you, gold buddy. I fell at his feet like a dead man because I know in my mind I'm looking at the full, according to Colossians 2.9, that Jesus now carries the fullness of the Godhead in himself bodily. The fullness of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All of God that makes God God resides fully in the Father, fully in the Son, fully in the Spirit, and now John is laying 
at a, like a dead man, being a good Jewish boy, he knows no one can see God and live. I am dead. This is going to kill me. I am beholding God himself in all of his fullness. And he describes him. His head is burning so hot with eternal flames that it, it, it's white as wool. His, his fleshly body is glowing like molten metal heated in the fire. I mean, it's just, it's so, he is so full of power and energy and life. Sword in his mouth. I mean, oh my goodness. This, this is, he fell his feet, trembling like dead. This is what Christ is about. When we see that word Christ in the scripture, it's not used as a synonym for Jesus. There are times where it is, but not always. That word Christ is such a powerful word. We cannot minimize it. If we do, we're missing the point. The word Christ is more about the Holy Spirit and his union with the man Jesus than it is about Jesus. If you could just make one little opening in your understanding where you would say, oh, I think I need to study that. You will find that we are not called the body of Jesus. We're called the body of Christ because we're of one spirit. We are ministers, not of Jesus, ministers of Christ. We are servants, the word diakonos, servants of Christ. Bond servants of Christ. Apostles of Christ. We have this salvation in Christ. There are in Christ realities. And the Bible does not use the word simply Jesus. It uses the word Christ. And Christ is not his last name. It's not like saying you're a disciple of John's or you're a disciple of Eckhart. No, that's not what it means. Because it's not his last name. We are to be the church of Christ. We carry the glory of Christ. We have a promise of life in Christ. We are to be strong in the grace of Christ. We have this salvation in Christ. We are hid with Christ in God. This is a tricky one. Hebrews chapter 6 says we are to leave the elementary teachings of the Christ and move on to perfection. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let me just ask you this. Who fills the believer? It's the Holy Spirit. Jesus if he fills us in some figurative language, he cannot fill us literally because he's flesh and bone. And the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. But when we speak of him figuratively, his presence, we're speaking of the presence of Christ, the presence of Holy Spirit, the presence of God among us. Jesus is not sitting on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit is. Jesus fills us, what 
the technical way of saying it would be through the agency of the Spirit. It's okay for us to teach children, yeah, Jesus lives in my heart. Well, how does he live in their heart? By the regenerative work of the Spirit. I'll supply your need according to the riches in Christ Jesus. Not just Jesus. Christ is a huge word. There are all kinds of sub-doctrines that, that are teachings that, that flow out of that. Jesus is his own person. Father is his own person of the Godhead. Holy Spirit is his own person of the Godhead. But when we are talking about God and Jesus in the plan of redemption, the plan of life for believers, the plan and the purposes of what God wants to do in the earth, Jesus just isn't the same guy who walked the earth. Everything he laid aside has been added back to him. And he is exalted. He is fully powerful. If the same spirit that raised Jesus the Christ from the dead dwells in us, he will bring to life, the Bible word is quicken, our mortal bodies. We have been Christed, anointed by the Spirit of God himself. He lives within us. The power of God and we like to sometimes jokingly say, children don't get a junior Holy Spirit and adults get the big Holy Spirit. Yet at the same time, we kind of say that jokingly, most Christians believe that the best any of us can do is get junior Holy Spirit. But he indwells us. Not just a piece of God indwells us. The fullness of God indwells us. We're to be filled, full of the Spirit of God. I know that if, I know that as I grow in my understanding and acceptance of this, it's, we're human beings, we are so convinced we're unworthy. I know people who preach the gospel all their lives and they're still convinced they're a worm and they're lucky to be saved by grace. We, we, we can think so small of ourselves. And that is nothing but the other side of the coin of pride. It's not believing what God says of us. God says we are the redeemed of the Lord. We are, we are brothers to Jesus in that he was the firstborn of many brethren. He's, we're not God's. Capital G, no, not at all. No one's saying anything like that. And we're certainly not diminishing anything from Jesus. We're just saying that Jesus, as a man, couldn't perform any miracles until he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then, after the resurrection and ascension, God declared him to Jesus this Redempt, redeemed man, the firstborn from the dead, declared him to also be Lord and Christ. Both Yahweh and the fullness of everything that makes God, God. That word Christ is amazing. So in Jesus dwells the fullness of the Godhead, in his body, he, it, it, it is in and with him. It's, it's him. There's a specific spirit that is at work 
in the world that wants to drain all of the power, all of the glory, all of the wham out of the gospel. And it's a spirit called Antichrist. You will note it's not anti Jesus. It's anti Christ spirit. Now, sure, there's going to be a fellow that embodies this whole thing at some point, and he will be the Antichrist, the man of perdition, he's also called in the scriptures. He's only mentioned this, this, this Antichrist thing is only mentioned like six times in all of the scripture. Twice it refers to uh, one or the other, the man or the spirit. But if we're not talking about the man, we're talking about this spirit, this this agenda that so indwells this man that he becomes the embodiment and the full expression of that spirit. The Antichrist, his job is to take the power out of the gospel message with believers. That we would drop back and disagree with what Paul said that my preaching was not just in words only but in demonstrations of power. An antichrist spirit within broader Christianity, its influence is to take the power out of the gospel message. Where, well, we just need to tell people the truth. There's no needs for signs, wonders, and miracles. Well, fooey on that. If we preach a powerless gospel, we're all just wasting our time. First, it has to have the power of a nuclear explosion to change a hard heart to a soft heart. And nothing can do that but the power of God. It actually changes the spirit of a person from being dead to alive. That's the work of the spirit. It's not a work of our preaching. It's the work of Holy Spirit. At creation of the world, the Father dreamed, the Son spoke, and the Spirit caused it to be so. Wham! The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead was instrumental. Holy Spirit, the Christing Spirit, is no less God than the Father and the Son. And we like to think of, well, Father God sure is powerful. We know Jesus is powerful. But the Holy Spirit, he's just, the best he is, is he's a comforter. He's a gentleman. And he's, what? He's a bird. He's a dove. Yeah. He is the wham of creation. Without the Spirit, none of this would have, it, it, was, it was a joint effort of the triune God. And he's like that in our lives. It was the presence of the Holy Spirit, that anointing that was on Peter, that healed every single person he walked past. No exceptions. It was that same spirit that indwelled Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, in his earthly incarnation, that healed everyone who came to him. Isn't that right, Abby? Yes. Everyone. Amen. Not like the Chosen movie says. Well, there are some that we don't know why they weren't healed. Fooey. This is God. This is God the Spirit. He heals everyone whom he touches. If we become convinced of that. If we truly come into agreement and faith with what the scripture clearly teaches about the Christ, we are not called Jesusians. We're called Christians. And not everyone who believes in Jesus, quite frankly, is a Christian. It was the disciples in Antioch who were first called Christians. Why? 
because of the power of the Spirit that they walked in. There are plenty of believers around the world now and then who were never called, oh, aren't they anointed? Why, why would anyone think they're anointed by the Spirit of God? There's no signs, wonders, or miracles following after their lives. They're just busy arguing about Bible doctrines. The best they have is man's wisdom and combined with the words. It's just a bunch of debate. It's just a bunch of language. But when someone finally shows up and says, someone needs to put their money where their mouth is. Let's pray. All those pseudo-prophets of Baal, false prophets that are prophesying the doom of the nation in the days of Elijah. Finally, someone, a, a true prophet, someone who is truly anointed by the Holy Spirit, says, we all need to put our money where our mouth is. Why don't you call down fire on that sacrifice? Let's see if you really have anything to back up what you're saying. And if we believe there's nothing necessary to back up what we're saying, we are wasting our time. As Christians, as Holy Spirit-filled anointed people, we can confidently say when we share the gospel with someone and they say, how do I know the words you speak are truth? That without hesitation... Anyone who's truly a Christian, filled with the Spirit, anointed, knows the Word, confident in their God, says, well, we just need to ask God for something. And he'll give us a sign, wonder, or a miracle. God wants to show himself strong. He wants to prove himself. He's just looking for real Christians. He's just looking for us to take him at his word. I, had, I tell the story sometimes of the guy on one of my job sites. He's convinced he's going to die. He's saved up his entire life. He's a multi-multi-millionaire. All he wants to do is do cruises with his wife in this next season of life. But I said, well, I just asked him, is there anything I can pray with you about? And he says, yeah. He says, the doctors tell me I only got three more months to live. That's why I'm selling the business and giving you such a good deal on all this stuff. He says, I'm just liquidating because I want to have at least a month where I can do what I've always wanted to do in my retirement with my wife. And I says, well, I says, do you believe in God? He says, yeah. I said, there's a start. I says, here's the truth. I gave him the gospel of salvation in Jesus. And I says, this is true. And to prove it to you, let's ask the Lord to heal you. And if you're healed, then you must admit and know that the words I just share with you are true because they were backed up by a demonstration of healing power. He just passed away. This, this was like 15, almost 20 years ago. He just passed away a year or so ago. Spent his last 15 years cruising the world with his wife. Because the gospel is true. And if we preach the gospel of salvation is true and we know who we are, we know who he is, and we know his heart for the dying lost world around us, signs and wonders will follow us. Some of us, again, we've fallen asleep. We need to have signs, wonders, and miracles following us again. So we're not just reciting what happened way back in the charismatic movement or way back in the move of God over there in such and such a place. Or No, for you, for me, this is what God wants to do. Now, you need to separate this from your church growth agenda. We're not trying to grow a church. We could care less if that person who is ministered to, gets saved and healed, ever darkens the door of this church. you gotta separate your, you got to separate your motive. Or it's not just, it's not love that you're walking in. And you're just going to be a clanging brass and a sounding cymbal. You've got to separate this stuff. We have to separate our agenda from the Lord's agenda. 
Jesus wants to touch a broken, lost world. That's my role. Some plant, some water, but how about the increase? The increase is the Lord's. The harvest is the Lord's. The harvest doesn't belong to me. I'm just a worker in the field. I'm not the owner. I don't have to worry about that. I just need to do my part. I need to believe the scripture, study to show myself approved. Study, study. Give yourself to this. What is that hope of glory that resides in you, that you're carrying around? It's not so you can have some success. It's not so that you can get what you wanted or dreamed. It is all for Jesus' renown. It's all for the advancement of his kingdom, not my fiefdom. If we can keep our motives pure, we will see the fulfillment of what God is prophesying to us. So when God talks about healing, miracles, the prophets all throughout the land, the globe, in congregations, in personal lives and encounters and dreams are saying a season of signs, wonders, and miracles are quickly coming. We had better be ready for that. Your mental wineskin needs to have room. You need to understand how that works. And so that you are not just standing on the railroad tracks declaring that a train is coming. Because there's a time to get off the tracks and on the train. We want to be on the train, amen? Okay, let's wrap up with this. I hope you're stirred. I hope that you are not finding this accusatory, but I, I'm hoping to awaken us to a need to understand. Signs, wonders, and miracles are what you are called to walk in. You don't follow them, they are to follow you. Your, under, you understand, your understanding of what Christ is and accepting your part and role in the body of the anointing and walking in that is essential for you as a believer, especially as a last days believer. We are called not only to believe on Jesus, we are called to be believers in Christ. As we were starting out this morning, I felt the Lord spoke to me prophetically. Um, I felt it for Rachel and Pam. I heard the Lord say, I'm about to turn your morning into dancing. It doesn't mean he's going to just bring you out of a season of mourning, but he's going to turn mourning into dancing. Something more than just getting free of the season of grief is coming upon you, but rather a season of rejoicing. And Rachel, in the very same thing that you have suffered grief, you will be rejoicing many times more. Father, thank you. Thank you, Rich. I'm not sure how we want to apply this. Do you have a good direction? And I, know, I know the Lord wants to. Oh. I'm feeling this in my life. 
I think of that scripture that says, once again, I will shake everything that needs to be shaken. To shake us. Uh, not in an act of anger, or necessarily violence, but something that is substantial. I suppose there's an element of violence, like it's, a, it's, an, it's a, an arresting kind of shaking. Like, wake up! Remember who we are. Remember who he is. And I feel the Lord wants to just just shoot a cannonball into that whole thing. You have anything to add to this, Skip? Um, okay. Don't go anywhere. So this morning, I woke up at about five, which is an hour earlier than I normally wake up because my sister-in-law, Gloria, who I think you've met, Jack's wife, had written me a letter about, uh, an email about something that I had written her earlier, earlier, which is about my hunger to see the revival that we were born in back in the 60s and the 70s. And that was a revival. It wasn't just a move, a charismatic movement. It was a revival. People of all ages and all walks of life, religious, non-religious, young, old, people in the ministry, fathers in the, in, uh, in the Catholic Church, nuns in the Catholic Church, Episcopalians, Baptists, were, were so hungry that they would, they, they'd drop anything to go to a meeting. They, they, they'd figure out ways to take care of the responsibilities they had so that they could, they could go to a house with a dozen other people. And the only reason they would do that is because the Holy Spirit would be there. That, that, that there, was, there was a hunger to know the presence of God. And it wasn't through enticing words of wisdom. None of those meetings had a speaker that could eloquently preach anything. Oh, yeah. You just yeah. went and you sang songs and, and lo and behold, the Holy Spirit showed up and not only surrounded you in the room, but also filled you. And you walked out of that meeting Im imbued with power. So I think it's very coincidental, don't you, that we're thinking about that at the same time that you're thinking about this. I think this is a, to go back a year to things that you preached a year ago, I think this is a crack in the dam. Yeah. Only it's not the time to put your finger in it it's time to take your finger out. And if it starts anywhere, let it start here. Are you willing? Are you willing? Are you all willing? Because he just told you what you need to do. And if you, and if you are here and he's your pastor and he's the apostle who's, who's the general of God's army and he's given you marching orders and he said, you got to study. What are you doing this afternoon? I mean, before the Super Bowl. Yeah. I mean, before, yeah. I mean, let's... For at least, at least an hour. Seriously, what are you doing? Are you studying? Or are you just reading? Are you, are you hungry or are you just curious? Do you know where you're empty and need to be filled or are you just wanting to wear the t-shirt? I think the anointing's on you, John, and to break the yoke. Okay? That's, that's what I got to add. I, it's not just you. It's, it's, it's a glow on the horizon. It's, a, it's, a, it's the sun coming up. It's coming. Take your finger out of the dike, my brother, my father, my pastor, my friend. There's an anointing on your life to do this.
Let's all stand. Well, let's all stand. And what really resonated with me is that to break the yoke. And there's, I, I, I do feel a, an, an anointing and an unction to, to break something. I was telling Linda, I don't know if something needs to be broken or released or whatever. And then that scripture, that, from reading, the scripture comes to mind. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to break the yoke, right? What is the purpose of fasting? To break the yoke, you know? So maybe this is really our moment. If your heart witnesses that this is a moment where you need to have whatever that yoke is that has been holding you back from being the student of the time, the student of the word, the student of a truth that presently God is putting his finger on for you. And you felt yoked into normal life, unable to break out of your ruts or your normalcy and become this ardent, serious, seeking so as to find student of whatever it is that God is doing. I believe there's going to, we will pray for the breaking of whatever needs to be broken but you want to have in your in your heart and in your mind an idea of what that is so you can be in agreement with what the spirit of the lord wants to do with you and then a releasing of a one of my favorite scriptures has always been about the tribe of issachar that they had a unique anointing to discern the times and to know what to do. God only says that about the tribe of Issachar. They could discern the time. Ah, this is the time. And this is what we must do. So we'll re release that over you as well. Linda, will you join me? And anything you want to say before we minister? Jesus has already died. He's already shed his blood. And as Christians, true disciples, there's a couple things that we're supposed to be doing in our lives. And that is all of what you're talking about today. But to put it simply, we're supposed to be healing the sick. And that would be Jesus's power moving through us. So some of it is the fear of man that needs to be broken uh, on me too. I mean, how many of you heard Lois's story and felt like, that's great. I, I wouldn't feel comfortable talking to a stranger. We got to get over that. Um, we're supposed to be healing the sick. We're supposed to be discipling others. And to disciple others, we need to be discipled. Who, who are you discipling? Who are you getting with and preparing for the Lord? We're supposed to be casting out devils. Why are you waiting on? Simple. It's not hard. There's nothing to be afraid of. A lot of a lot of the sickness is because of a devil. It's because of a spirit. Spirit of fear. It's a spirit. Simple. You just cast it out. So there's things that we're supposed to be doing. We have responsibilities. And when I tell you the story of a man praying for somebody and then sending his sons, spiritual sons, to go pray for this person until they see it come to pass, a foot being restored. We all want that. We want that power. But are we going to do what it takes for that power to operate in us? It's what he's talking about. Getting into the word. Getting with the Lord letting him move through us and being obedient when he says go pray for that one go lay hands on that one cast the devil out of that one the last thing is is don't think that you can live in and practice sin and any of this is going to work you cannot live in sexual immorality where you practice it you're looking at porn 
secretly. You can't. You can't have sexual immorality uh, living in your life with, with other people and other, other sins, pride. You can't do it. We are called to be holy and righteous, right standing with Jesus. So like Isaiah said, when God showed himself, I'm a man of unclean lips. Jesus, come and touch us. Like the story you told, uh, was it Smith Wigglesworth? That when he stepped onto a train, people all around, what must I do? There's a holiness and a glory of God that his people are going to be walking in in these last days. And he's called you to walk in it. You. You. So, if you like hands to be laid on you, have in your heart and mind what it is, the yoke that's being broken, and uh, then we're going to release that discernment, that spirit of Issachar, the same, that same understanding of the Holy Spirit that rested on the tribe of Issachar to rest on each one of us. Amen. If you like ministry, come on forward.